welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today. I have as my very special guest, Eileen Roach. Eileen is with Amazing Designs and she is the editor of Designs and Machine Embroidery. And do we have some special techniques for you today. Let me share with you some of the beautiful projects that Eileen has brought. This quilt is absolutely fantastic. And one of the things, let's kind of look up here at the top. There are, there's fruit, there's strawberries and oranges and more strawberries and onions and peppers. And the fact that Eileen wanted me to share with you is that these were all done on a small hoop embroidery machine. You don't have to have a big hoop machine. And in order to connect them, she simply did a wide zigzag out of a green thread on her sewing machine. Instead of just plopping one here, one here, one here, she indeed connected them. Now this is another square that I really, really like. Once again, done on a small, small hoop embroidery machine. The grapes and the apples and the cherries were plopped one right on top of each other to make this wonderful picture that looks almost like a Rembrandt painting of fruit. Let me go down to the next quilt that Eileen has brought. I think this quilt is spectacular too. See this dad stocking? This is a Christmas stocking and there's a stocking on here for every member of the family. This one has dad and has different quilting fabrics. This embroidery was done just on a small hoop, but look how wonderful it is. Once again, the old zigzag, just connecting it up with a fish, which makes it look like you had a hoop that went from here to here and you really didn't. I also would like to share with you this wonderful Christmas tree in the middle. These are just little Christmas ornaments that have been stitched down once again using the small hoop and even the packages. One, two, three small hoops there and it looks like you had a huge embroidery hoop to work with. Now let me share with you some of the other beautiful things that Eileen has brought. This cowboy vest is wonderful and the fence is even more special than you can even imagine. The fence is also used as buttonholes to close the vest. This is a very, very unusual idea. It's called embroidery scape. This is an iron-on transfer. Those wonderful little English doors and windows is an iron-on transfer. And then the embroidery is done on top of the iron-on transfer, once again, using a small hoop. This little piece was embroidered together. This little piece, you don't have to have a large hoop. Another one of the landscape, the beautiful embroidery scapes with iron-on transfer, and then the different embroidery pieces just placed around on top of the iron-on transfer. This is another wonderfully stylish jacket which has beautiful embroidery on it. Once again, all of it done with a small hoop, just its placement that is so critical. And the technique that Eileen is going to be sharing with you is the silk ribbon in the bobbin. And in this beautiful jacket, the silk ribbon has been used to connect down and to connect and to connect the little pieces as we go across here, all of them done on a small hoop. And now won't you come over to the technique boards with me and let's begin to find out some of the magic that Eileen has brought to share. I have two very fascinating techniques to share with you. First of all, Go ahead and machine embroider an M or an alphabet or a monogram of any, whatever your monogram is, a monogram of your choice. Now, this is part of the magic. Using silk ribbon loaded into the bobbin, you take this out of the embroidery machine and you have uh, the Solvi or the water soluble stabilizer on the back. You simply stitch all the way around from the back and then when you come over here, you'll simply get a tapestry needle, load up the silk ribbon tails and take them to the back and tie them. Now then, on this M, you will see that there are some wrinkles around here. Don't worry about that. Your water-soluble stabilizer is still behind here, so when you take all of that off, the wrinkles are going to go away. Load it back in the hoop, and we're going to do a small design right here. Now, you do not have to have a large embroidery machine to make large embroidery. This is going to show you how it's done. A small design is placed here. Now over here on this one, you can see we have that same small design going from here to here. It's just simply in the placement, knowing where it's going to go. So we've made the next part of the heart that's going to go around this M. 
Now, once again, we have just the small design. It only goes from here to here. This design has been placed correctly. Once again, we're making the next part of the heart. Let's go over to the next one. Let's move to this side. Once again, the small design from here to here. You just have to have a small hoop to make this wonderful big embroidery design. It's placed correctly. Oh, this is so wonderful. We've got two, two more pieces or one more piece right here. You see it's beginning to look like a heart because we've placed one, two, three, four, five small designs. And then to finish the heart, Right here on the bottom is the final placement. And in a few minutes after I take off the salve from the back and press it, all of those wrinkles are going to go away. Now you see, you don't have to have a large hoop in order to be able to make beautiful large designs. I'm so happy to welcome as my guest today, Eileen Roach. Eileen is with Amazing Designs. She also edits the magazine, Designs and Machine Embroidery. Eileen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. I am thrilled to be here today. And I'm going to show you the silk ribbon technique. You want to thread your silk ribbon through the bobbin and first cut it off at an angle so it's easier to thread. Then place it on the bobbin winder on the machine. Set your machine at the slowest setting and gently guide the ribbon onto the bobbin. You want to take your time because you don't want it wrinkled. And once that's complete, remove it, place it into the machine, and you're going to pull up the silk ribbon bypassing the tension. So you don't want to catch it into the bobbin tension. And this takes a little bit of a trick. Sometimes you have to hold on to the silk ribbon so it doesn't all come flying out. At the next point, you want to take your, your monogrammed letter and you're going to place it into the machine bed wrong side up. And that's very important because you have your um, needle threaded with monofilament thread, which you don't want showing on the right side. I have selected a stitch length of 3.5, which is a normal basting st stitch, excuse me. I'm going to um, put my needle in the down position and very gently stitch right next to the monogram letter. There's turning a, those curves and I, Yes, you really have to take your time. You know, uh -huh. and many of the new machines today have a needle presser um, that you, I mean, a presser foot lifter that you use with your knee, which is perfect for this application because you really are going to be going up and down around all these curves. And I'm going to outline the inside of the M first. And I do stay at a slow speed because I find it's much easier to control the machine. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stop right there, lift, pivot, turn all the way around, and come back. And that's a 3.5 stitch length. It is, and stitch. I use a nice uh, tiny needle like a 75 uh -huh, sharp uh -huh. because the silk ribbon is so delicate. And if you happen to stitch right into the embroidery, um, it doesn't make, make any difference. It just is a bit of a tighter look and that's perfectly acceptable. But what's so nice about this look is that the silk ribbon just flows off that bobbin and it gives you a very delicate appearance. And uh, it's something that is normally achieved by hand, but you can do it on your machine. That if is you, so pretty. Yeah, it really it is. Really and outlining is. the machine monogram mm -hmm. is just fabulous. Right. It adds such dimension to the embroidery. Oh, Eileen, thank you so much. And now Eileen has a magnificent piece of lingerie to share with you. Eileen has done this absolutely fabulous uh, nightgown, short nightgown. Now, the technique, as you can see, that we did earlier with the uh, ribbon and all of the good placement of those tiny little designs is used in connection with this beautiful scalloped edge that goes all the way around the top, all the way around the bottom. And I just have to turn this around to share with you how adorable the sides are. There's a wide piece of lace inserted and that same scallop is used to go down the sides. Now, Eileen, Tell us all about your techniques you use for this okay. beautiful gown. Well, what I did was I select a scallop stitch, and I did use a 30-weight embroidery thread so that my stitches would be very close together. I drew a line for the outside edge of the garment and then stitched right on it. I made sure that there was tearaway stabilizer underneath, and I put matching thread in the needle and bobbin. I then would just cut away very close to my stitching line. I and used that a very wonderful side. Oh, that wonderful yes. side treatment. <laughs> well, for the side treatment, what I did was I 
you know, put my side seams together as in the normal fashion. And then I pinned my lace right on top of the side seam, centering it. And then I did the same um, scallop stitch on each edge and then cut it away. That is absolutely fascinating. Now show us how on earth we do that oh. centering. Well, you know, it's so important today to be able to get the most out of your embroidery machine. And even with one of the machines that have a smaller hoop, if you use a small design and just connect it, uh, you can get very professional results and end up with a large design. What I have done with the heart is I use a template of the design and I put um, a mark in each of the holes that are provided on the template and then I remove the template and make a cross connecting each of the dots and then I mark that with my cloth setter or with the template that came with my hoop and then I'm assured of perfect placement and I can go on and on. Just as, something that template is so important. It is. To be able to know where to put right. the different points and then just plop it down Yes, there. and it takes all the mystery out. Show us this so This cute. is a beautiful quilt that I did for Christmas, and that's called the stocking quilt. Not a very creative name, but aptly <laughs> um, named. This is actually looks like a very large hooping, but it isn't. It's one, two, three, four, and five different hoopings. But because I have templates, I know exactly where they're going to stitch out. And I'm able to... Um, play with the designs before I even take a stitch. And I'm always happy with my results because I know where they're going to wind up. Now you can do um, pieces of different sections of embroidery and stitch right on top of each other. And when you now do this that... this is still done with a small embroidery that's right. hoop. Is and that correct? That's okay. right. We have one, two, three, four, five, uh, maybe six hoopings here. And the stitching does get very dense. And when it does, I just change my embroidery needle to a denim needle and sometimes a thicker um, yarn, not yarn, but embroidery thread to a 30 weight and then I don't have any problem putting all that thread on top of each other. Make sure you use a good stabilizer underneath and every time you'll get professional results. Now slip this up and show us that one too. I I'm so fascinated with the radish design. Oh, the How radish border is just beautiful. Oh, I love it. You know, and one way to get really professional results is to connect your embroidery designs. If they aren't actually together like here, by just drawing the eye together to the next design by using a satin stitch and a pretty embroidery thread, you get a very professional result. And these were free motion quilted later on. And so that was just a small hoop there. Yep. This was free motion, and mm -hmm. these, this is simply a, a tight satin stitch to right. connect it. And it looks like you had a 5,000 foot wide it embroidery does. machine. It does. And it oh, Eileen, thank you so much for your tips and for your wonderful lingerie and for being here with us. Thank you. And next I have a silk ribbon technique for you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today Beverly Sheldrick from New Zealand, who is one of the Silk Ribbon Embroidery Authorities of the World. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's always good to be here. Now, Martha, today for your viewers, we have a kimono here, and I have tried to use stitches which follow the Chinese theme. And so we're, what, the one we're going to do today is this lovely twisted one. It's a, a little slow to do it and it does take a certain amount of effort. But I think you will agree that the final result is worth the, the time that you take. It takes quite a lot of ribbon too, that's something else. Now you'll see here that I have another one here that I've done. Now to start off, you, you draw this oval like this and you will see that I have a second oval here and that it's not placed in the center and this is how you get the full effect of it. Now very simple really it is done with a seven millimeter ribbon and you will also notice that I have a big fat needle we call it a hoary big needle <laughs> um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist the ribbon like this, put your thumb on it like that and then wind it round like that and then put the needle through there like that. Now you will also see if you look at this one that I've got partly completed here that in this section the winding is that much tighter and also you will also see that some of them are shorter than others. So with this one, where I've done that one there, I may even come back like this and twist again and put another one just over the, this like this. So we have this effect 
of those lovely, you know, spiky chrysanthemums that you see. They just are so beautiful. And in this, with these longer ones, you can have a little less tension in, you can see here, that we have a little less tension when we've wound here, whereas these ones are really quite tight. Now, the, the buds are actually very, very simple. Again, it's just this twisting, and you will see from this one here, have one going one way a little bit shorter. Now, for the centers, um, I would normally do the centers in the same color, but to, just to make it easier for you to see, I have used another color, and it is just a great big loose French knot. You can see how this is quite loose. Instead of sitting firmly on the needle in the way that it normally would, then it's just like that, so that when you take your needle through, you can see how it is just like that. And do these quite tightly together. It just gives them that lovely crunchy center that you can see in here. Um, they're, they're quite tight. Just pull it like this. And continue to do that. Now, as far as the, um, the buds are concerned, I don't put any top on them. I simply put a straight stitch between here and between here. And you'll notice also that there are very few leaves that I've used. The leaves also are just a simple ribbon stitch, uh, just scattered around where you need them. Oh, Beverly, this is absolutely fabulous. Thank you so very much. And next, I have a doll dress for you. My doll, Cecil Elizabeth, is wearing one of the most beautiful doll dresses that I have ever seen. Look at her little high yoke that's just covered with lace. I love this collar. It has three rows of lace insertion with gathered lace edging, and this long, this wide strip goes all the way across the shoulders and to the back. The skirt, which is made out of peach nalona, which is Swiss Batiste, is absolutely beautiful. I've used a regular 90 needle to do a pin stitch along the edge, but you could just zigzag. The little football shapes have curved lace, straight, straight, straight curved, and then a beautiful gathered lace edging on the bottom. A very, very elegant dress, and I'd like to share with you how easy it is to make that skirt, which looks so hard, but it really isn't. First of all, trace your whole skirt lace shaping design onto a stabilizer. And I have the scallops on both sides with the center points. The next step is to simply zigzag three pieces of lace together and put them right in the center on the whole strip. Now some of you might not ever have seen lace just being zigzagged together. This is the most basic and the very first technique and French sewing by machine is simply butting two pieces of lace together and zigzagging them. And I've been doing that for a long, long time and that is the most basic principle of beginning French sewing. Now let's go back to this lace shaping. First of all, you're going to put the three strips down on the stabilizer and the next step is we're going to do the scallops which are going to cover these stri three straight strips. All right, I've already started shaping the lace scallops. I will put the pins, and by the way, I stick pins into oh, almost a cardboard box. These are just cardboard boxes covered with fabric. Pin, when I come to the corner, pin at the bottom, pin at the top, fold it back on itself into a curve, remove the pin that goes through the bottom, and I'll come back around and start shaping again. Now the little ruffle that is right in here, you know, the part that's sticking up, French laces have a gathering thread built right in, so I'm going to stick my pin underneath the gathering thread and give it a little tug and look what happened. The lace lay down just absolutely perfectly. So I'll do the scallop on the outside and the scallop on the inside all the way around the skirt. 
Now, after I get the lace scalloping done, I will then zigzag the inside only of both sides. The inside only of both sides. And now, remember, this is just stabilizer I'm working on. After I zigzag the inside, I will then get some gathered lace, or rather get some lace edging, pull the thread, come in here, pin it along on the bottom to butt it up against the scallop. Then I will zigzag the gathered lace to the bottom of the scallop lace on the bottom of the dress. And then after trimming away all of the stabilizer, let me unpin this a little bit so you can see it. I will simply take my football lace piece, put it down on the bottom of my skirt. I will zigzag the top only to attach it to the skirt. And then I will come in here and trim away the whole bottom of the skirt. And that is absolutely all there is to doing this beautiful football skirt. Let me refresh your memory. We have three pieces of straight lace in the middle. Then we do the scalloped on, at lace on both sides. Then we tear away, then, excuse me, then we go ahead and zigzag the lace edging onto the bottom. We do all of this while the stabilizer is still attached. Then we cut away or tear away all the stabilizer, place the football piece onto the skirt, and then we come back and zigzag, or in this case, we did uh, Madeira applique or the pin stitch with a 90 regular needle, and we simply came around and stitched it there. Now, you don't have to. You can use just a zigzag. You do not have to use a Madeira stitch. And then after it was zigzagged, we came in and cut away the rest of the skirt. Now, that is how easy it is to make that wonderful football skirt. And now, I'd like to invite you to come to my attic. This is one of the most magnificent collect pieces in my collection. This dress I purchased in Massachusetts. It starts with a really wonderful, very high neck collar with pin tucks. Of course, they've all been whipped by hand. I certainly am glad I didn't have to whip all those pin tucks by hand. Look at the beautiful, beautiful work on this bodice. It has mitered lace, it has pin tucks, it has little insets, what I call fancy squares right here. There are folded tucks, there are, are beautiful wide tucks on the side, and these beautiful pieces of mitered lace in the middle come down to a little bit below the waist. Speaking of the waist, the waist has a beautiful inset of two pieces of lace and some little tucks. Now before we go down any further on the skirt, I'd like to show you this unbelievable sleeve. It starts with wide tucks at the top, then comes down into a mitered V French lace, then tiny little rolled and whipped tucks with those little stitches just going round and round, and then V, mitered Vs at the bottom, and the bottom, and you can see I have a little torn lace there, but that's okay. I love the dress anyway. I have a V down at the bottom of the sleeve. Now, I'm going to pick this dress up so you can get a much better look at this magnificently beautiful skirt. It has three little Vs in the center, and then two pieces of wide lace that go down three tucks, then another piece of lace, a beautiful wide tuck, three more tucks, and look at the miters in the front. I absolutely adore the use of tucks on this dress. It is over and over and over again, all different types of tucks. As was the case usually on these wonderful Victorian dresses, the back was as pretty or nearly as pretty as the front. I think you will especially enjoy seeing the close-up of this little tucked piece that goes around the waistline and then the lace on either side. Do you see how the back has all the tucks that draw in the fullness for this tiny little waistline? And by the way, I'm thoroughly convinced Victorian women had nothing to eat. Let me go ahead and hold this back of the skirt up. It is once again absolutely beautiful with its tucks and lace and oh, two or three different widths of tucks on the back of the skirt. By the way, the fabric is Swiss Batiste and the laces are French. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I've had such a good time having you as my guest. Won't you come again next time?